so good like the day class so today we're going to have a short lecture on rigid uh, frames this week so rigid frames consist of two columns and a beam or girder that are rigidly connected at their joints applied loads produce axial bending and shear forces in all members of the frame since the rigid joints restrain the ends of the members from rotating freely so in addition vertical loads cause a rigid frame to develop horizontal thrust as it weighs. A rigid frame is statically indeterminate and rigid only in its plane. Okay, so these are the details. So this is the crown. So the rule of thumb over the crown depth is S over 40. This is the pitch, it is 1 is to 12, 2 4 is to 12. Then the connection here is bolted or welded to resist movements. This is the shoulder, this is the height. 8 feet to 30 feet or 2.4 to 9.14 then you have here the base is 8, 8 inches to 20 inches and the typical span is usually 9 to 36 meters so usually you can see these rigid frames in uh, warehouses and some uh, gymnasiums when you reach your higher um, what you call this when you reach Class, your higher um, engineering mathematics or engineering science, there will come a time wherein you're going to compute the, the moments and the loads in designing uh, long spans such as these uh, rigid frames, for example. Right now, uh, in Building Tech 3, our, our concern is just to familiarize you with the details. Okay. So, you won't be able to gain all the knowledge class regarding rigid frames in this class. So that's why I encourage you to read also other books and connected, uh, that are connected to our lessons. And when you graduate, you should have experience not only in the office, but also in the actual construction as well, then on different building types. Okay, so architecture class, this is a type of discipline wherein you're going to undergo constant learning okay, so you're not you're supposed not to be static you have to continually learn you have to develop your own processes so i'm just here to present you with the basics and the rest is up to you okay so let's move to the structural framing system so the columns uh Extend in a continuous vertical uh, in a continuous vertical line to the foundations. The load thus being transmitted by the shortest path. Okay, so so these are the arrangement of vertical components. So this is one and two here. Then here the loads are transmitted solely by the vertical centrally located load bearing. Components, the core consisting of concrete walls or steel columns, the outer zones being free from supports at the ground level. So here, these are the columns. Then it's uh, hanging at the sides. Okay. So unlike here, so the columns are continuous also at the side also. So these are some examples of the arrangement of vertical components. Then here, the structural loads are transmitted to two widely spaced main vertical load bearing cores for bridge type buildings. Okay, so as you can see here, the triangular patterns. So this is the support of the bridge. It goes here a certain span. Then here, alternatively. The intercepting girders may take the form of story height lattice girders, which are economic, economical means of constructing long spans and can appropriately be incorporated into stories intended more particularly for the accommodation of land. Then here, if the story height intercepting girder can be installed only at or near the top of the building, the intermediate vertical components Assume the role of hangers or ties, the whole loading of the building being transmitted through the main columns. So here are the main columns.
Okay, so how to strengthen the framing system? So the framing system can be stiffened against horizontal forces in the following three methods. The first is the structure is composed of rigid frames which may comprise some hinge joints but there must be sufficient rigid joints to ensure that none of the nodes of the frame is free to move sideways. The members may be straight or curved and a variety of shapes may be chosen for such frame structure. Number two, a bracing system consists of a triangulated framework of rolled sections and hold the joints together and further strengthen the framework against lateral loads. The center lines of members converging at a joint should intersect at one point. The joints themselves are conventionally assumed to be hinged so that the members are either ties or struts, loaded purely in tension or compression. However, the overall bracing effect of a lattice system can be enhanced by constructing it with stiff members and rigid joints. So as you can see here, class, there's an addition of um, bracing systems to strengthen the structure as well. So when you design and you conceptualize the structure of your building, so these are some of the things that you're going to consider. But aside from the conceptualization class, when you reach the point that you're going to have the details, of course, you're going to compute it and you're going to learn that in your higher engineering science or mathematics. And the third, finally, shear walls in the form of more or less solid diaphragms, usually of reinforced concrete, transmit the wind and earthquake forces by shear and bending. Okay. So as you can see here, there's a shear wall to strengthen the building. So when you say shear wall class, these are not made of CHB. So this is uh, pure uh, solid concrete. So it's really strong. Okay, so remember the three um, ways in strengthening the framing system. Then let's go to the ultimate structures for skyscrapers. Then the high-rise building conceived as a rigid tube. So it's what you call the tubular frame. So if a high-rise building is of suitably compact shape on plan, circular or not too narrow in a rectangle, the external columns can be structurally merged with external lattice bracing or with spandrel girders so as to form a vast rigid tube. This stiffening system is particularly effective and economical. This is due not only to the optimum distribution of the bracing but also more particularly to the cooperation of all the columns and bracing or spandrel girders in the external walls. So this is an example. This is the John Hancock Center, Chicago. The architects are Graham and Skidmore, Owings and Merrill. So I think Skidmore, Owings and Merrill, SOM, they're quite uh, famous in the Middle East because they have designed a lot of high-profile structures there. So employs the tube in its framing system in this 335-meter-high, 100-story building. All the horizontal forces are transmitted through external bracing, thereby substantial saving has been achieved in comparison to the bracing system located in the interior. The external lattice members form a distinctive architectural frame. Okay, so you can also appreciate thus that the external bracing, it also looks good outside also. Okay, as well as it is uh, structurally functional as well. And let's go to the joining of steel members. So steel shapes can be ju joined in the building frame using any of the following fastening methods. The first is by riveting. So a rivet is a short pin of malleable metal such as iron, steel, or copper with a head at one end used to unite two metal plates by passing it through a hole in both plates then hammering down the point for a second head. In structural riveting, a hot steel rivet with a form head is inserted in the holes through two members to be joined. Its head is then held with a hand hammer with a top-shaped depression while a pneumatic hammer drives a rivet set repeatedly against the other end to form a second head. So the rivet shrinks as it cools, drawing members tightly together. <coughs> Excuse me. 
So these are the types of rivets. You have the countersunk raised, the countersunk flat, the button corn neck, the button straight neck, the pan cone neck, the pan straight neck. So familiarize yourselves class with the different rivets. So in bolting, the bolts are commonly used in uh, these following categories. So you have carbon steel bolts so or common bolts so are similar to the ordinary machine bolts. Carbon is still having no specified minimum content but of alloying elements. So the minimum copper content does not exceed 0.40%. Then you have high strength bolts which are bolts made of either high strength carbon steel or quenched and tempered alloy steel. Tempered meaning heat treated during manufacture to develop the necessary strength. It is usually tightened using pneumatic or electric impact wrench. Okay, so this is our last slide. So a major problem in high strength bolting or friction type connections is how to verify the necessary tension has been achieved in all bolts in a connection. So there are several ways to achieve proper tightening. So first is the turn off nut method, it's a load indicator washer, and then the tension control bolt. So this is a round head stove bolt. This is a flat head stove, stove bolt. This is a carriage bolt, and this is a square head machine bolt. So let's end our lecture with this one. Uh, if you have any questions or clarifications, class, please ask, send an email. Because I won't know if you have any questions if you don't um, if you don't send feedback in our group page or in my email or even through our through, in YouTube. Okay, so see you next meeting. I'll be posting our activities and our respective pages for both 2A and 2B. Okay, so stay safe and stay motivated in pursuing your dreams to become architects.